Whether we like it or not, politics plays a significant role in the criminal justice system. Here in Harris County, we have a number of important local races, including a heated debate with the district attorney's office. As we head into the last week of voting, we ask ourselves, who are the candidates? What political agendas are they pushing for change? And how does all of this affect you? Good evening and welcome to HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My name's Carmen Rowe and I'm the president of HCCLA, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. We're the largest local criminal defense bar in the country. And tonight, we're going to delve into crime and politics, not just here in Harris County, but across the country, with our special guest, Channel 26 legal analyst and political commentator, Chris Tritico, who will talk about this and much more with our hosts, Jimmy Ardwan and Damon Parrish. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our program. This is HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. I'm Jimmy Ardwan. My co-host, Damon Parrish, is also here. We are very honored to have Chris Tritico, as Carmen said in our opening, with us tonight to talk all things politics. It is the election season, after all, so it is right for us to talk to Mr. Tritico, who is the host on KRIV Fox 26 Roundup every Sunday morning. Before we get to Chris, though, I want to introduce my co-host, Damon Parrish. Damon, how are you this evening? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Before we get started, Damon, I want to bring up a huge, huge issue that happened this week out in the Eastern District of California, the Sacramento Division Federal Court. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, in the last year about the legalization of marijuana, and we had a huge evidentiary hearing the last three days granted by a federal judge over the scheduling of marijuana. Tell us a little bit about that. I will, absolutely. So I think first we should have an understanding of how the jurisdictions work. You know, in the United States, you can be prosecuted either on the state level or the federal level. So anytime you're arrested by the FBI or DEA or U.S. Marshals, that's what we call a federal crime. Now, the federal government in 1970 classified marijuana as a Schedule I narcotic. Uh, there are four different schedules of drugs in, classified in the, federal, in the federal government. Schedules one, two, three, and four. Schedule one is illegal. Schedule two, three, and four are illegal. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Sounds so, pretty simple. It is pretty simple. But, but you know, Damon, I read I, and I, I downloaded a copy of this from Pace. Or I downloaded a copy of the motion to dismiss the indictment filed by defendant Brian Pickard. And it, it's really got some interesting issues in here. He, he moves to dismiss the indictment on, mm -hmm. on a few different grounds. Uh, first, the, the scheduling of this is, is over, uh, scheduling of marijuana is over-inclusive when viewed in light of the factors that have come out and recent research as to what the effects of marijuana are. What, what, what's that all about? Absolutely. So like I said, in 1970, when they classified marijuana as a Schedule I, they said they did so because they believed that it was a dangerous drug uh, and it had no redeemable quali qualities to us, right? Uh, that it was just a, a narcotic and, and there, was no, there was no use for it. Well, recent studies then and now have shown that uh, marijuana has plenty of medicinal med medical uses, as well as uh, on the recreational side, it does not have the negative qualities associated in the 1970s. So therefore, it's been over-classified and it should not be a Schedule One, maybe a Schedule Two, Three, or Four, or potentially just a maybe an over-counter drug or just, a, or just a normal drug that's not on the schedule system. And I think Mr. Pickard has hired two or three experts to come in and testify to those facts and try to convince this judge out in California that, that the old way of thinking with regard to the effects of marijuana, just it doesn't play in today's world, does it? Uh, no. And I think if you're going to have a hearing, an evidentiary hearing, about the medical uses of marijuana, you need to have somebody who is qualified to, to talk about that, and probably more than one person. And that's what he's done here. He's gotten people who have medical backgrounds and have done professional studies on mar uh, marijuana to be able to competently say with their, within their own expert field that marijuana has 
uh, uses outside that is that is useful, that is not as dangerous as it once was considered. And and they've got an evidentiary hearing on this, and and frankly, that seems to be quite a rare rare thing to get, uh, particularly in light of the politics behind marijuana and the scheduling of it, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I mean, to have a evidentiary hearing on whether a drug should be legal or illegal, and you have to remember, Jimmy, this is at the trial level. This isn't in front of an appellate court or a Supreme Court or Congress. This is just a trial level hearing, which could uh, have an impact, you know, for all of us, you know, depending on how this works out. The, the last issue they bring up, which is, which is extremely interesting, Damon, is they talk about in, in August of last year, I think there was some, um, a big, well, there was a big memo that came out from the Department of Justice, Jim Cole, the Assistant Attorney General, Deputy Director uh, of the, the uh, Department of Justice, he issued a memo along with Eric Holder basically saying with regard to Washington and Colorado, the two states that legalized marijuana, that the feds were just going to back off and they weren't going to prosecute and, and let the states handle it. And, and now Mr. Pickard has, has raised this allegation that doing so violates the Equal Protection Clause. Absolutely. <laughs> so like I said earlier, when there's two jurisdictions, there's a federal government and a state government. Uh, and most crimes can be prosecuted on both, both levels, federal and state, you know, murder, arson, that kind of thing. So could possession of marijuana. Well, recent trends have shown that a lot of states have legalized, and I believe 23 states have legalized medical marijuana use, and two states, uh, Colorado and Oregon, have legalized marijuana, period. And so now we have the federal government saying, hey, we're going to let the states decide. We're not going to prosecute. We're not going to deal with, uh, with the distribution of marijuana, leaving it up to the states. Well, that creates a problem because if you do not live in one of those states and you use marijuana, well, you still will get prosecuted, and therefore you're not treated equally as someone who does live in Oregon or California or one of the other 23 states that has medical marijuana. So what he's saying is we should be treated fairly. We're all in this country. We're all in it together. So if it's good for them, it's good for me, and it, let's, make it equal, let's make it equal protection, which is guaranteed under the 14th Amendment for all of us. This is a fascinating argument because I think what's most fascinating about it is it's in the Ninth Circuit. Right. Uh, and I, I think it actually may have a, at least some sort of a chance to, to get heard uh, and make some traction and headway in the appellate courts, in the federal appellate courts. So this, this certainly will be an interesting one to watch as we go on. And I know it'll have ramifications, not just across the country and in federal courts, but it'll have them here at the local level as well. Uh, and getting to our local level, I want to I bring in our guest this evening, <coughs> Uh, Chris Tritico, he is a very prominent lawyer here in the city of Houston. He started his career with Racehorse Haynes. He is a partner at the law firm of Tritico and Rainey here in Houston. He practices criminal defense. He also does education law. And on the weekends, he moonlights as the host of The Roundup on KRIV Fox 26 here in Houston, a political talk show. So he is the appropriate person to come in and talk about politics here in Harris County. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you joining us. You bet. Um, I want to talk about this evening kind of the politics of judicial elections. Um, this has been a long-standing issue. I, I think there's been a lot made about it over even the last 20 years, particularly here in the state of Texas. Um, I think you can go back as far as the late 90s, Frontline, the PBS program, went back and looked at, at all the stuff and, and kind of said that Texas was a battleground, so to speak, and, and it goes back to the days of Karl Rove. Well, it does, and it actually goes back further than that. 60 Minutes did a piece before Frontline that, that uh, the headline was, is, is justice for sale in Texas? And it was about the Texas Supreme Court justices taking $10,000 donations from lawyers who were litigating in that court and then ruling on cases that, that were pending by those lawyers. The, the, the politics of our judicial selection has been a problem for Texas for a, a long, long time. I've been practicing almost 26 years. Uh, it's been a problem that, that I have felt in my entire career that our system for selecting judges is flawed by the party politics by which the judges have to, have to play to get elected. And just to be clear, Texas is about one of seven or eight states that are solely based upon partisan elections right. for their judges. Yeah, it, it, it's a bad system. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible way to select judges uh, by allowing the parties. What, what the judges have to do now is they have to get involved with the party politics, which means they have to get, if you're a Republican, you've got to get very, very conservative to win your nomination uh, so that you can get on the ballot. If you're a Democrat, you've got to get very liberal to get on the ballot. And then you can't get back to the middle where you're, where you're going to say, I'm a fair judge. When you've when you've had to get to the extreme to get that nomination. So, Chris, tell tell us 
because I, I'm not really that familiar with the, the different types of elections, but we have kind of, I, I think, a number of different types across the country. Can you tell me what the different types are? Let's, let's talk about that. Now, in Texas, as we've said, it's a pure partisan race. So you, you're either Republican or Democrat, a Libertarian, whatever. You get on the ballot as a, a, in that party. There are a <clears throat> great number of states that have a appointment and retention system where the governor would appoint the judge, and then when they're up for re-election, they don't get an opponent. They're just on the ballot as a yes or a no. I don't want to retain this judge, or I do want to retain this judge. If they're voted no, then they're out, they're out and either, either the governor appoints a new one, or then at that time there's an election. Uh, that's a horrible system. And let, let's look at the, well, if it why was, is that. Well, let's think about Texas. We've and and I'm not getting into party politics here, but we've had the same governor for 12 years. So if Rick Perry was allowed for 12 years to appoint judges, he would have appointed virtually every judge in the state of Texas. And then he leaves office, but he leaves the Rick Perry stamp of approval on every judge in the state of Texas. But isn't that what Rove tried to do? I mean, Absolutely. Was, wasn't that his philosophy in Texas? He made Texas in the 80s the battleground to push getting the judiciary as a as, as a component or extension of the the Republican Party. Well, the, absolutely, and, and that, that's been their push. But when you have an, an, an appointment and retention system, you get a judge appointed by the governor, and, and, and I would be as opposed if it was a Democrat in office for 12 years. I'm not saying it just because it's Rick Perry. I don't believe that one person ought to have the authority or the ability to shape the entire jurisprudence of this state. And that's what happens with appointment and retention. Because once they're appointed, it's very hard to get people to go to the polls to vote no. And so they're there for life. That's a, that's a horrible system. But that's what we have in our federal judiciary. Well, no, in the federal judiciary, you're appointed for life. Right. And, 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 that, and that's, that's the way the system is. But when you're, when you're just appointed and you don't have to, you don't have to run for re-election, I don't have to talk to anybody about staying in this office, then I'm, I'm there to be fair. I should be able to be fair. The problem with our system is, is every four years, our judges have to go back to their party, they have to go back through the nominating process, and they have to get reelected. And so then they have to go out and tell the people, here's, here's why I'm tough on crime. And, and, and that's horrible. Well, well, Chris, let me ask you, do you think Texas would be better served with adopting a more federal system mm -hmm. where the judges are appointed for life and then therefore they don't have to candidates of votes, they can actually just make the rulings they think are fair? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I don't mind electing judges, but I think that there is a, is a way to elect judges that makes it fair and takes politics out of it. And, and, the, and the Tritico plan, All right. which nobody's adopted <laughs> yet, but it's the Tritico plan, let's just be clear about this, is to take judicial elections nonpartisan. There, you cannot be a, a, affiliated with a po political party to run for judge. And they're going to, we're going to make these elections in the summer off year. So in other words, the only thing that's happening is the election of whoever's up for this bench. And if you want to run for, just pick a bench, you want to run for this bench and it's open this year, then anyone can sign up and run and you're not going to be tied to a political office. Well, let me ask you about your plan, though, because, uh, I mean, you say put it in an off year and put it in the summer. Uh, wouldn't that disenfranchise some voters? I mean, the summer everybody's on vacation. They're more worried about having their kids summer plans or going to Disney World or whatever. So uh, does that disenfranchise the average well, citizen and, and make it then become only lawyers voting, well, for instance? Okay, well, let's take that, let's break that down. First, that, that may be a very valid point. So put it, put it some other time of year. You're not having it in the summer. I'm not tied to that. The Tritico plan can be amended. <laughs> um, it's not but, a dictatorship. It's right, exactly. <laughs> but, but the disenfranchisement is an argument that I hear every time I talk about this, is that you're disenfranchising the general public from voting. Well, first, they're not really voting in down-ballot races anyway. And so they're, they're the people who elect judges are the people who are doing straight-ticket balloting. And, and I don't like that. Yeah. But secondly, let's say that it does drive only lawyers to the polls, okay? And I'm not trying to do that, but we're the ones who know. We know these judges. We know who's running. We know what they stand for. We know what they mean. We know what happens when you elect X over Y. And so if those, if lawyers are the only ones that vote because they're the only ones who care, then fine. But if you, if you follow what I'm saying and, and, and put it at a time when they're not tied to a political party, the people who go to vote in those elections are the people who really care. You know, I, I, I think so strongly about voting. When I was in college, I voted in an election when there was only one person on the ballot. But I didn't want to miss my chance to vote. Those are the people who need to go to the polls. Well, Chris, let me let me ask you a question uh, about the Chris plan, which I like. I like this the, the Tritico plan. By Sorry, the, way. the Tritico right. plan. I apologize. Um, 
<coughs> Don't you think the, the, the parties serve another purpose in that in order to run for office, you have to go through the primaries? So they, they in, in effect, weed out people to a certain point to where you have one person and one person as opposed to just kind of a large mix of people to vote for. And it'll be kind of hard in a, in a place like Houston, which has so many judges. You end up with 12 know. people on yeah. one race. 12 people, Absolutely. one race, one court, 200, 300 people running for, for so you end up So you end up with a runoff is what would happen in that instance. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about the primary process. That, that if the primary process for judges was only used to weed out people, that would be fine. But what we, what we see is judges running for office saying, I'm tough on crime. Well, you're not, you're not allowed to be tough on crime. The Constitution doesn't permit you to be tough on crime. But to get elected, they have to tell the public, I'm tough on crime, because that's what the public wants. They want crime fighting. And they don't really realize, they're not thinking about the fact that a judge is supposed to be above that fray. But the political consultants on both sides of the aisle say, you go out and tell people you're tough on crime. And don't worry about what people like Tritico think, because there's not enough Triticos to, to vote you out. The public wants somebody who's tough on crime. And they're violating their canons. They're violating their ethics by, by running campaigns saying we're tough on crime. And so you take the politics out. And another thing about the party politics that I wanted to talk about is the, the and this is why the political parties won't let this system go easily, is they charge, both, every political party charges everyone running for judge $10,000 in, in the coordinated political campaign. So everybody that's on there, how many judges do we have in Harris County? 75, 80? At least. At least, if not more. Times 10,000, times everybody running for, for the political parties every cycle. All right, why would the political parties want to get rid of that kind of money? And so the, the parties have no incentive to get rid of this because they're making money off of this. Right. And, uh, and the judges like it because they get this coordinated campaign, even though that, I don't think those really help, but they get this coordinated effort. But my plan is a better plan because it takes the politics out, and that's what judges need to be apolitical, period. Well, oh, another question for you. Uh, and uh, for the critical plan, you also mentioned that if, if lawyers voted, for judges, what, what harm is that? Because lawyers work in those courts and we're the most frequently in there. And we know, we know who these people are. We know who they are. But do you think that in a, a certain way that eliminates the will of the people? I mean, they can vote, but if, if what ends up happening is only lawyers vote, do you think that kind of creates an elitist class of lawyers or voters uh, kind of taking a, it a can. person from the, the system? I think it can end up that way. I mean, that's, that's not what I'm pushing at all. I am not pushing that at all. I want everybody to vote in every election, a everyone. If, if you are a voting age, go get your voter registration card and go vote in every election. And I'm not trying to disenfranchise people. But the people, you know, right now uh, in, in, in an election, now this is kind of a hot, heated governor's race this year, so we're going to have a little bit of it. But I will, I will guarantee you right now less than 25% of the public votes in the election next week. And so they're already disenfranchised because they don't care. Right. Okay, and so if the only people that are electing the judges are the people who know and care, then that's that's it, that's a system I can live with. Although I really want everyone to go yeah. to the polls. We're talking with Chris Tr Tr ah, Chris Tritico tonight. Almost couldn't get that out. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, he's the HCCLA past president, criminal defense lawyer here in Houston, and host of Fox 26 The Roundup. If you'd like to participate in our show tonight and get involved and ask questions, tweet us at, at @hccla underscore. TV, and also you can send us questions on Facebook at HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. You can also call in to our show. We're going to have the phone line up on the screen in a little while, and we'll start opening the phone lines up in about 15 minutes or so. Chris, I want to go back to one thing you touched on, and that was uh, the Republican Party and their mantra of being tough on crime. Uh, and, and we get flooded with tons of these things. All the time. All the time. The, the general public gets flooded with them. I mean, I, I, I look at this one, uh, and it says, vote straight ticket for every Republican and every Republican judge. I mean, that sounds like some sound advice right there, doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen? I mean, it, it's really, they're giving out some really poor advice, in my opinion, and right. it, they're borderlining on uh, some, some real problems in terms of the judicial well, ethics, aren't well, they? Well, everyone knows, both parties know, that straight ticket balloting is what wins down ballot races. And... And quite frankly, this whole election is going to boil down to who wins the governor's race in Harris County. If Wendy Davis ekes out a, a Harris County win, right. I don't think she can win the election. But if she carries Harris County, all the Democrats are going to win. If, right. uh, if Greg Abbott carries Harris County, all the Republicans win. All of the, 
all the politicking that, that these guys can do doesn't make any difference at the outcome at the outcome of this race. It's who who carries the top of the ticket. Now you got the DA's race that's that's creating a lot of talk in Harris County, but it's really going to end up being, in my view, that governor's race. And if the polls stay the way they are, Greg Abbott's going to carry that thing. And well, so. uh, I I would agree with you on that one. And do you think there's any merit to the fact that in the last two presidential elections, at least Harris County and was blue? Well, Harris County has voted Democrat in the last three elections, right. and so and Dallas has been voting Democrat now in the last five or six elections, Dallas County has voted Democrat every time. And of course, Austin and, stays blue. Well, yeah, and you're seeing the metropolitan areas become more blue. Right. Um, and so, and eventually, you're going to see Harris County voting consistently uh, Democrat like it did when I was young. And, and, and when I was growing up, Harris County was always Democrat. It, it switched uh, in the last 20, 25 years, and you're seeing that switch come back. But right now, Harris County is almost evenly split, mm -hmm. and the election is really carried every time by which who at the top of the ticket carries those voters. Barack Obama has carried the last three elections for, for Harris County, and but he's not on the ballot this year. And so can Wendy Davis bring enough vote buff people to the polls to carry this election and i think that's that's a little bit hard for her because greg abbott is from houston and so he was he lived here for a great number of years he's got a lot of political contacts here so that makes that race for harris county a lot harder for wendy davis i agree and if i was wendy davis i would be here every week uh, leading I, I wouldn't have, i would not have spent time in a whole lot of other other jurisdictions chris right. we, got a, right. we got a question coming in our on our at hccla underscore tv twitter feed uh, and the question is, what about term limits for our state judges? Would that help? In the I case? am I am completely opposed to term limits on any level. Why? Uh, I, because look, it, it, if you don't like the job this person's doing, that's that's what we have elections for. Go to the polls, and that's why I'm totally opposed to the retention system for judges because you can't ever get them out of office. But but I don't think term limits serve a whole lot of purpose. You're seeing the city of Houston's experiment in term limits about to change because they found after after the short period of time that we've had term limits on the city of Houston level, the mayor and council are about ready to change that because by the time you are, you're in office for that six years and now you've got to rotate off, you're just now learning how to govern. And, and so why do you want to take somebody, you've invested all this time in them, and then just say arbitrarily you can't be here anymore. If it's a good judge, I want that judge to stay there as long as that judge wants to be there. If it's a bad judge, I'm going to go to the polls and vote against that judge. And that's the way the system should work. But the danger of straight ticket voting is we, we sometimes retain these judges oh, I, anyway. No, don't it? get me wrong. I, I, I don't believe in, in straight ticket voting. I've never done it. When, um, when I go to the polls, uh, I may vote my party at the top of the ticket. But when it gets down to the, to the bottom of the ticket, I am voting the person that I know is best suited to be in that job. And I tell my family, these are the people that are best suited to be in that job. And I don't know what they do because I, I can't uh, go to the polls with them. And we might have a lot more winners if I could. <laughs> um, but I, I don't believe in straight ticket voting. And I, I, I don't push that. Now, the Democrats and the Republicans both push straight ticket voting. If you're going to vote for Wendy Davis, then you just push that one button and you can go home. Well, that's, they, they know that's the best way to get the whole ballot elected. I don't think that that's good for our judiciary because there are Democrats who are bad judges and there's Republicans who are bad judges, and those people need to go home. Uh, I think we have a phone call right now. Um, caller, are you on the line? Maybe. Do we have a call? Echo, echo. Well, while we wait on the caller, uh, Chris, I got a couple questions mm -hmm. for you. First, um, when it comes to the the balloting system, do you think we can implement a system that mirrors the Tritico plan by just eliminating straight ticket voting and party designations on the ballot to where you can still be a, uh, a party affiliate? You can still be a Republican or a Democrat. You don't have to lose that. But on the ballot, it doesn't say that. And do you think that would help out? Yeah, I don't think, yes. Uh, the answer is yes. I think that that would be a system that would make it more fair. But I don't think you're ever going to see the Republican Party or the Democratic Party agree on getting rid of straight ticket balloting. And that's why if you take the judicial, judicial elections out of that, 
you can still have your straight ticket voting for the political offices. Because my objection to the judges is they're not politicians and they shouldn't be politicians. And so if you take them out of the political race and give them their own election, we can have all the politics and all the straight ticket voting we want because that's not affecting the justice system. And speaking of politics, do you think the district attorney's office, that role is political as opposed to a judge's role, which is not? I think it has to be political. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the DA, the DA is an elected official. It has to be a political race. Uh, I, I, am, I am fascinated by this year's race. Uh, it, it's, it's a great thing. It's a it's great thing to watch. It's, uh, it's exciting. Uh, they jockeying every day. Uh, both Devin Anderson and Kim Auger jockeying every day. It's a, it is a classic race to watch this one. I, I want to go and ask you a question, Chris, about uh, what Justice Kennedy of the Supreme Court said a few years back. And he said that as a judge, you make a promise for neutrality. That's I mean, exactly ex right. Expound upon that. Well, look, th that's what I'm talking about is the judges aren't politicians and they shouldn't be a part of the political process. They should be running for judge because they want to be neutral. I just want to call balls and strikes. If at the end of the day I call, I, I make my rulings and the jury finds this guy not guilty, I did my job. I'm not going to go out of my way to ensure that somebody gets convicted, as some judges have suggested in this cycle, get convicted because I'm a Republican. And I, and I view my job to see that people get, get convicted. Well, that's what I can't stand. And that's what I can't support. And what Justice Kennedy is saying is, is we have to be above this. Judges have to be above the politics. They have to be above the, the will of the people, quite frankly, because the, the, the best judge out there is the one that has the guts and the integrity to rule in a certain way, even when the tide of public opinion is against him. But it's the right way to rule. Well, speaking of will of the people, if the will of the people is, in fact, that tough on crime judge, aren't, isn't the, the power of the vote to express the will of the person, aren't they served? I mean, aren't they getting what they want? Not, by having a tough on crime judge, not as that's a judge. the will of the people. You can't, you, the, the, that's what I'm talking about, where a judge has to say, I'm not going, I'm not going to just be tough on criminals. I'm not going to ensure that people go to prison because the public wants good crime fighting. That's why we have a DA. Right. DAs get to be tough on crime. Judges don't have that luxury. And Chris, if you hold for one second, I actually think we have a caller on the phone now. Uh, caller? Yes, hello. Hello. I was going through my medical information, and I noticed that Cymbalta is a controlled substance now. They also made, uh, I believe, Tramadol controlled substance. If you can get high off of either one of those drugs, I'd like to know how. So what, what does it mean? Now those are controlled drugs. Are, are they going to have checkpoints for uh, Cymbalta? I'll hang up. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. Um, and thank you for your call, by the, your call, by the way. Uh, so, as, as we said, the federal government classifies drugs on four schedules, one, two, three, and four. If Cymbalta and Tramadol are, uh, are uh, controlled substances, they're probably scheduled under Schedule 4, meaning they have some use, but maybe the federal government believes that there is something about them that's addictive, something about them that is dangerous, that requires a little more monitoring than, let's say, Nexium or Lipitor, which, you know, which is a prescription drug, but not a kind of drug that the government thinks you can OD on or sell on the street for, for money. Uh, so to answer your question, I don't know how you would get high on Tramadol or, or Cymbalta, but if it's a scheduled drug, my guess is it's a Schedule 4. Uh, most scheduled drugs that are Schedule 4s would be like Vicodin, Xanax, Alprazolam. Schedule 3 drugs are usually drugs that are in the hospital that we would have anyways. And then uh, Schedule 2 drugs would be drugs like Ritalin, Adderall, morphine, uh, things that require a very close government scrutiny to use. But don't you also think that the reason that's a, those two drugs that he mentioned are scheduled is because, uh, or controlled substances, is because they have to be prescribed by a doctor. And we don't want me getting a drug prescribed by my doctor and me share it with you when your doctor hasn't evaluated you for that, which is why we control those substances right. to prevent, it makes it illegal for me to share that with somebody. Not that you're going to get high, but you might kill yourself. Well, uh, all, all prescription drugs are, are prescribed by doctors. So you, even Lipitor is prescribed by a doctor, yeah. but it's not a controlled substance. Uh, 
you have a caller? Yeah, we do. And it appears we've got our phone phone system worked out. Again, if you have any calls uh, and questions, please call us at 713-807-1794. The number's up on your screen. You can also send your questions to at HCCLA underscore TV on Twitter. Uh, caller, good yes. to hear from you. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. I, have, I understand there's this concept on the law of citizen's arrest. Y'all uh, aware of that, of course? We are. We are. I, I wouldn't advise okay. it, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. And there's also this thing in the law about civil asset forfeiture. Yes. Can a citizen do a citizen civil asset forfeiture? Only if you want to go to prison. Yeah. We call that robbery. <laughs> Or, or, or ag robbery, depending where you are. No, I wouldn't advocate any kind of citizens performing a citizen civil asset forfeiture. Uh, that does exist, and it is robbery. It is something that's already illegal, and I, I just wouldn't do that. And, and, and just to be clear, uh, although we can't really dispense legal advice on this show, I don't think anyone here condones any kind of vigilante justice, whether it be right. uh, acting a, a, in a, and, on a criminal case or in a civil asset forfeiture. And I think setting. it's important to say what a, what a citizen's arrest is. Yeah. You, you have to see a felony in your presence or an immediate breach of the peace before you can act. You can't just stop a speeder on the side of the road because he's driving dangerously. Right. And so, and, but it, it's a very dangerous game to get involved in. You can get killed that way. Mm -hmm. uh, there, we have police officers who are paid to bring their guns and their, and their handcuffs out. They'll let them do that. Absolutely. Chris, I want to loop back to our initial topic, uh, the, the marijuana schedule um, hearing that went on out in California and, and kind of tied in a little bit to what we've been talking about here this evening. Uh, with you about the judicial politics in, in the judiciary because in your opinion do you think a hearing like what we described would ever happen in a state court here in Harris County? Well uh, no and here's why. First I think that that's such an interesting case uh, and their their winning argument there is the Equal Protection Clause. The, the, the Attorney General of the United States when Colorado uh, legalized marijuana said we will not be enforcing the federal marijuana laws in Colorado and I believe <coughs> Washington was Washington State. Uh, Washington, it, it was Washington. Washington, right. Washington State. So there's two states out of the 50 that the federal government is not enforcing the law in. So what they said in this California case is, wait a minute, you you're not enforcing it there. You're violating my right to equal protection. That's a winning argument wherever you file it. So why wouldn't we see that in a state court in Texas? Well, first, marijuana is still illegal in Texas, and second, you don't have an equal protection claim by the state of Texas because it's the federal government that's refusing to abide, refusing, refusing to enforce the law. All right, And so that's why I don't think we'll ever see that here. Texas is not ready to, to legalize marijuana, although marijuana, we're seeing a, a change in really 24 months. We've seen marijuana go from the scourge of society to the President of the United States in a press conference saying, I did it, it's no big deal. And so I, I predict marijuana is going to be legal 10 years from now all over the country. Uh, it's moving that way. We don't, as a society, we just looked up one day about 24 months ago and said we don't care about this anymore. And 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 so I don't. I, I think that you're going to see marijuana legal everywhere before before long. Well, Chris, let me ask a question since we're on marijuana. What about the idea that the marijuana that's that exists today is not the marijuana we think of when we think about marijuana from 10, 15, 20, 40 years ago, and that now you have uh, marijuana that's just way more potent and, it's, right. it, and it actually in some cases is addictive well that's because of the additives it's it's not it's not the plant it's it's the it's the additives and the in the in the in, in the chemical not chemical the the growth engineering of the of the marijuana plant that they have done that changed it and it's the same thing as the cigarette companies putting in additives to the tobacco to make us all get hooked on on cigarettes well that's they're not making you hooked on marijuana but they're making it stronger by adding stuff to it and by the way I heard we need to investigate I heard that that case in California was funded by Doritos <laughs> I'm not sure or <laughs> that's what I was told. Or, or Jack in the Box. Jack in the Jack Box. Jack in the Box has a munchy meal deal that I'm pretty sure he has legalized. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, Mar our, our good friend and, and colleague Mark Bennett tweeted in, and he says that uh, Tramadol is actually Schedule 4 and that Cymbalta is not scheduled. Oh, there and you so, go. And so he thinks it's probably going to fall under the dangerous drug category. Okay. Right. Uh, more than anything else. So thank you, Mark, for tweeting in. We appreciate uh, you sharing our no your knowledge with us and with our viewers. This evening. And your quick research. <laughs> and getting it to us very quickly. <laughs> um, 
Chris, we talked about the DA's office race, and you, you, had, you talked earlier about how heated it became. There was a little incident today, wasn't there? Well, uh, <coughs> wow, <coughs> spit it out. Choke me up. They're getting to you, man. They're getting to you. <laughs> That's right. This, this race has been, has been evolving for a year. It started out a, um, a, a just your average regular race, and then uh, Kim Ogg uh, started really, really hitting hard, and uh, Devin Anderson had, to, had started hitting back, and I think the race really changed uh, over the summer. Devin Anderson was in trial. Our DA rarely picks juries. Uh, we, uh, what, what kind of cases does does the DA usually pick juries? Capital on? murders only. I, I can't remember Johnny Holmes ever trying anything but a capital murder case. And um, when when Mike Anderson won, he said he was going to try capital cases. He'd already picked one out, and then he got cancer and unfortunately passed away. When Devin took office, when the governor appointed her, she said, I'm going to try that case. So she picked a jury on a capital murder. While she was in trial on this capital murder, Kim Ogg called a press conference in front of the front of the courthouse and announced her drug plan before Devin could announce hers, forcing Devin to get out of trial and come out and say, well, I have the same plan. Well, that kind of, kind of put a slide on, on Devin. And that really started, you started seeing this race heat up. Uh, on that, and and you asked me about today's issue, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm drawing a blank. So you're gonna have to sure. Remind today, me of it. today there was a obviously there was a Harris County deputy who was killed oh, yeah. uh, in a in a collision that involved a parolee who uh, Kim right. Ogg alleged that Devin and her office uh, gave him a light gave her the a light sentence. very light sentence. And and and, and Kim suggested that uh, this person was a habitual, and and from what I know, and I haven't had a chance to research this, but from what I know. Her, her a habitual is someone who gets three convictions, and then they can then or, or on your third conviction you can get 25 to life, minimum 25. Does it matter what kind of conviction? Could yes. Be misdemeanor, speeding, does it matter? No, it has to be felonies, and that's yeah. what I. With, the information that I got was her second conviction was a state jail felony, which I don't believe will allow you to bootstrap that up into the super felony, the 25 to life. I haven't seen anything. Kim Ogg called a press conference and basically said that, that they killed this, this guy. Well, I, I don't agree with that. This defendant in that case got a two-year sentence for a, a small amount of cocaine. And we all practice law. Right. There is nothing wrong with that. I mean, as a matter of fact, I have never, in 26 years of practicing law, I've never had anyone go to prison for a small amount of cocaine. And so I, I think that was, a, that was as, as good a sentence as you're going to get for that case. Even if it was her second time around, it, it, it's as good a sentence as you're going to get. I don't think it was a fair assessment to say that, that they treated this person lightly because I don't think that was the case. But it sure caused a firestorm today in this race and caused uh, Devin to really kick back pretty hard. I think we have another caller coming in. Uh, let's go to the phones. Hello, caller. Uh, hi. Uh, good evening, James. This is Clint Davidson. I ran into you fellows uh, this afternoon. You asked me to call in. <laughs> hey, Clint. How are you? I'm doing fine. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to call in and mention that, uh, that I agree with the position that judicial races should be nonpartisan or independent. Um, if I could run as an independent in the future, I certainly would do so. You know, I'm, I'm grateful to the Green Party for asking me to run uh, for County Criminal Court 13. Uh, it's about as close as I could get uh, to being independent, at least to be between the Democrats and the Republicans, which, uh, you know, I don't think either of them really had much interest in. Uh, at least they didn't approach me about it. Do you have a question, Clint, for our guest? Uh, uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to, to make that comment that, that you know, I, I – yeah, I also support that position, you know, and, and I'm also a judicial candidate. So, you know, there's there's some support out there for the for the notion of nonpartisan uh, judicial elections. Well, we're glad to have you a part of the Tritico plan. <laughs> well, thank yeah, yes, indeed. All right. Thanks. Thanks for taking the call. You guys have a good evening. Absolutely. Thank you, Clint. Um, bye bye. Well, Chris, I want to ask you a question because you're talking about uh, what happened today. Now, what are the ethical considerations involved in one just a DA race? Uh, in general, just what kind of in, in campaigning and finance and what you can say, what you can do, and then taking those considerations, uh, do you think there's been an ethical issue or overstep or, or and not just in this one particular act, but throughout this race, which has been cont uh, contested? You know, I don't I don't see any real ethical lapses here. I, I, I don't agree with what Kim said today uh, about the uh, that, that conviction. I don't agree with that. But. I don't see that that as an ethical problem. Uh, she's not saying 
what she would have done. They both said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be lighter on, I'm going to be lighter on minor amounts of, of drugs, uh, Devin on marijuana, uh, Kim on marijuana and uh, trace amounts of cocaine. But that doesn't mean, in my view, an ethical lapse because the DA is the top law enforcement officer. The DA does get, to, despite what Devin said today, the DA does get to pick and choose what they're going to, what, what cases they're going to prosecute and what cases they're not. That's the person we elect to make those decisions. Here's what I will prosecute. Here's what I'm not. And, uh, and somebody comes in and says, here's my case. I want you to prosecute it. The DA gets to say no. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't have a problem. We talked earlier about you know, all these tough on crime things and, and Kim Ogg's the Democrat, so we expect the Democrat to be soft on crime. No, we don't. You know, people elect a DA because they want a DA that they, that's going to prosecute people. I want to elect someone in office that, that's going to take care of me and ensure that when I get out of my car at my house, somebody's not going to stick a gun in my face. That's what people elect DAs for. I expect anyone running for DA to say, I'm going to be tough on crime. Who, who would elect a DA that's not? I mean, so I don't, have, I don't have a problem with that. It's the judges that I have a problem with who say I'm tough on crime. You can't be, and that's my, that's the ethical lapse. Well, I guess what I was, I was thinking about is, do you think it's an ethical issue uh, <clears throat> for one candidate to say, hey, you were soft in a situation where that same candidate would have been, has, would, would done the exact same thing? Uh, to, to, to say your actions led to this, this outcome, but my actions would have been the exact same thing. Do you think that th there is in there an, an ethical issue or just an issue of poor judgment? Well, uh, let, me, let me figure out what you mean by ethical th issue. Do you mean like state bar ethical issue or do you mean ethical issue just morally? I mean just morally. Okay. I, no one's getting disbarred here. I'm just, just, just morally just in, in how we do campaigns and being fair and honest right. to, to those who don't practice, do you think that's, that's an there's, issue there? There's not much moral about our politics these days, which is why I've never run for office. You know, my goal when I got out of college, Sam Houston State University, by the way, which is the best university in Texas. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think that I don't think that needs to be responded to. That is not part of the uh, plan, by the way. That's right. Um, um, now I lost my train of thought. The we. What was I? What were we? Well, it's because you went to Sam. So That's right. I lost my, I lost but we were, we were talking about uh, uh, morality and, no. and, 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 and elections. That's politics. Okay. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's a rough and tumble game. It's gotten more rough and tumble in the last 10 years, last 15 years than I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it, it's how, how hard can I beat this other person down to win? And, and it, it, it completely talked me out of running for office because I don't want to put my family through that. I don't know why anybody would want to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's politics. And so is it morally wrong to say something that you don't truly believe in? Absolutely. But in a political contest, am I going to say things that, that are pushing the edge and pushing the line of, of truth? I have to do that to get elected, and that's the problem with our political game right now. We're, we're talking with distinguished Sam Houston State alumni Chris Tritico this <laughs> evening. He's giving us his thoughts on everything political here in Harris County. Keep your phone calls coming in, 713-807-1794, and keep the questions coming in on Twitter, if you will, at HCCLA underscore TV. You can also follow us on Facebook, HCCLA Reasonable Doubt on Facebook, uh, if you get a chance. Chris, uh, one, going back to the DA's office race again, one of the things I want to know is there's been a lot talking about the statistics. Um, I guess a recent poll had this in a essential dead, dead heat, 25% to 25%. <laughs> Talk about what those numbers really mean for it. Well, they really don't mean anything because what, what you got to look at, and, and it came out, and I think the poll that came out last week had Devin Anderson at 24% and Kim Ogg at 23 or something like that. That's, let's just assume 24 and 23. That's 47% of the population. And the, what the poll said was those people have already decided that that's who they're going to vote for. Well, that leaves, I'm no mathematician, but that leaves about 53% <laughs> of the population who hasn't made up their mind. Once even again, a, a Sam graduate, Sam Houston. <laughs> even a Sam Houston <laughs> Bearcat can Bearcat. do that math. Yeah. Um, that means that that election is still a toss-up. I mean, if there's 53% yeah. of the people haven't made up their mind yet. And of those, of those people who hadn't made up their mind, a great number of people didn't even know who was running in the DA's race. Those are the people who go and just hire and fire people without knowing what they're doing on election day. Um, 
And so nobody knows who's going to win this race. But I still go back to what I said in the beginning. And what I truly believe is, is that it, it's up to Wendy Davis and, and Greg Abbott to carry the county to see who's going to win that race. But there may be a little bit more voters straight on the DA's race than any other because it is really getting a lot of coverage. Stuff. I think we have another call uh, coming down the line. Hello, caller. Uh, hi, I had an initial question, but just going off on what you said uh, just recently, what's the difference between the two district attorney candidates, if, if any? And on the second question, talking about elected judges, is, are all judges elected in Texas? And how is that different from across the nation? In other words, are other, are all, other, do other states follow the scenario where judges are elected? And, and how does that work? And if so, um, how does, uh, do organizations play a part in this? Can anybody donate to judges, and how does that work? So what's the difference between the judges, I mean, between the DA race, are all judges elected, and how does uh, money come into play as far as electing some? Sure, thanks for your question. Let's let's break it down into two parts. First, I, I think maybe the easiest because the differences of the DAs may may take a little while. L let's answer his question about the judges and and kind of how how we break that up. I mean, we've got as you talked about before, we've got differing ways in in each right. state. And Texas is a full party partisan party, election. Party partisan partisan election and and we are in the minority in the in the nation on on electing judges that way. <clears throat> Uh, I don't remember you had the number, but it was like seven states only or something like yeah. that, that that have a just a partisan election. The, the next highest measure of electing judges, I think, is the appointment and retention system. And I don't know how you may have that number. I don't know how many states do that. But that's where the governor would appoint. I think we have a map up. Oh, there you go. A graphic yeah, we uh, do have to a map. kind of show and where the see. different states yeah. lie. And, and so we do have, we across the country, we have four different kinds. We have a merit system. We have some variation in some other states that, as you said, could be a, a, an appointment and retention. All system. of those are retention type elections. Right. right. So if you could, for the caller, I guess, talk about, you know, why a, a retention versus appointment is, is a bad idea. Well, I, I think it's a bad idea because you, the, the governor appoints you, and then to, to, when you come up for re-election, it's just a yes or no vote by the public. And so the public is going to just go to the poll, not have anyone else to vote for. You just say, yes, I'll keep Tritico, or no, I don't want him anymore. Well, that's, it's almost impossible at that point to get rid of right. a bad judge because there's no one to campaign against that judge. And so that's why I'm opposed to that system. There, it really turns into an appointment for life, but you still have the money involved because, as, as the caller said, what about the money? Well, I have never met a politician that wouldn't take your money. And you know, how, many, how many solicitations have you gotten this year from judges to come to their fundraiser and give them money. My firm, we have a, a policy, we won't give more than $150 to any judge because with 80 people on the ballot, or actually, with, let's say there's 40 races up this year, that's 80 people on the ballot that are asking me for money. So we, we've just put a firm limit, that's how much we're gonna give and that's it. Well, and I think Justice Kennedy a few years ago gave a really good quote that I found regarding that. He said, if an attorney gives money to a judge, with the expectation that the judge will rule in his interest or his client's interest, that is corrosive to our institutions. Mm -hmm. That is corrosive to judicial independence. Right. Now, I agree with that. And I think that just sums it up. It does. And I agree with that. I've, I've never given campaign contribution to anyone expecting them to do anything for me personally, especially as a judge. Um, I, give, I give money to the judges that I like. <clears throat> and that I want, uh, that I want to win. But look, he, he had another answer. What's the difference between these two DA Right, candidates? right. And I want Not to get much, to that. <laughs> really. If it, look, if you look at them substance-wise, Devin Anderson and Kim Og are equally, in my view, competent to run the DA's office. They've got good, solid ideas. Devin's uh, marijuana plan would still have people arrested, but then they could do community service and not have a conviction. Uh, Kim Ogg says, I'm not gonna arrest people for marijuana or minor amounts of, of cocaine. And, and those plans, neither one of them will say this, but those plans are driven budgetarily. All right, we don't really care about marijuana in this country anymore. And budget-wise, budget I can take 10, 15 million dollars a year out of the misdemeanor courts that I'm prosecuting marijuana cases for, and I can put that on the bank robbers and the home invasions and, and, and the big felonies, and I can, I can adjust that budget better and have better prosecutions for big, bigger name felonies than, than putting a bunch of whole class of young people in jail for a misdemeanor amount of marijuana. 
That's what's driving this. They won't say it because they can't, because the public wouldn't like it, but it's the truth. And, and I think both Kim Og and Devin Anderson, both they, they worked for Johnny Holmes yeah. back in the day. So, I mean, they, they learned at the at the foot of the same person. Right. Uh, they learned under the same policies. Are we really just looking at essentially the same person, just with an R or a D by their name? And they're also both former prosecutors, correct? They were both prosecutors. Uh, look, let's, you know, Devin was a prosecutor, became a state district court judge, became a criminal defense attorney, and is now the district attorney. Kim Og was a prosecutor, became the mayor's uh, uh, gang czar, became the head of Crime Stoppers in Houston, and it, it be, now is a criminal defense attorney. Their, their paths have not changed that much. Mm -hmm. I think they're both highly competent, highly professional uh, in, in, their, in their roles. I think either one of them would be a great DA. Whoever wins this race is going to be, we're going to be in good hands, whoever wins it. So the differences are minor. And that's why the party politics becomes in play. And you've seen, now you're seeing uh, Devin hit Kim really hard on TV because she's got the money. If you notice, Kim Ogg's not on TV because she doesn't have the money, the bankroll that Devin got to, to do the commercials. And so how is she getting on TV? She has a press conference every two days. And I want to I ask you about that because historically, I mean, the Democratic Party of Harris County, let's be honest, they've been about as organized as the front office of the Oakland Raiders. I mean, they, <laughs> they have. They haven't been able to get candidates uh, that, that are really, that anybody would, I think, want to vote for. Uh, is, is that, what's well, the deal? Are they getting better? Are they making a well, the inroads there? The Harris County Democratic Party is actually very well organized. It's okay. a funding issue for them. And the Democratic Party statewide has been, has been hammered for what? 20 years and so getting your your organization back in place where you're going to start winning elections after being hammered as hard as they have for years Tom DeLay came into the state and got Governor Rick Perry to allow him to gerrymander the congressional district so the Republicans would win every race and all of that is going to take time for the Democratic Party to undo all of that but you are seeing like Harris County move more to a Democratic uh, voting block than they have in the past 20 years since I've been uh, since I've been practicing law. You, when I started, everyone was a Democrat, and right after I started practicing law, you started seeing Mary Bacon switch to a Republican from a Democrat, and some other judges switched, and then the Republicans swept in and took over all of them. Every for a while, every elected job in Harris County was a Republican, and now you've got a few Democrats that have won. And this election is going to be interesting to see if the Democrats can carry Harris County again without a, a national figure at the top of the ticket. Okay, so I actually have two questions for two questions for you, Chris, and uh, one for you, Jimmy and Chris, because you guys both have a large federal practice, or you do a lot of federal mm -hmm. work. Uh, since we're talking about an addition, a, a different way of electing judges, um, and the federal way does not have that way, is there are there more? fair judges do you do you think that the the, the the judges in federal court are fairer across the board than they are in state court i mean because if not then do are we really arguing over nothing then as far as changing the way we elect judges if even when a lifetime appointment where there is no fear of re-election and you can do pretty much whatever you want you still get the same result well you've you've seen it and, and jimmy you probably agree with me on this you see i think the same the same thing in federal court that you're gonna see in state court. There are some judges who are just completely fair all the time. There are some judges who are extremely liberal all the time. There are some judges who are extremely conservative all the time. And you know when you go in there, if you've done your homework, what's gonna happen when you walk in that courtroom. The difference between a, an elected uh, judge and a, and a federal judge who's appointed for life is the federal judge doesn't care what anybody thinks because it doesn't matter. I'm going to rule the way I'm going to rule. If the Court of Appeals wants to reverse me, I don't care because I'm still going to get paid for the rest of my life. And so that's why I don't like that system. Um, but, you know, it, I don't think there's any distinction in my view between the the, the political side of it or, or the no, bias, I, I, if you will. I, I would agree. I, I, the thing I would say is just from practicing both is that I feel like the federal judges that they – 
they don't they don't play necessarily party politics, but and they feel more insulated in making their decisions because they know they can make a decision, and the only person that's going to be second guessing them is either their direct court of appeals or potentially the Supreme Court, and that's it. They're not they're not answering to voters. They're not answering to anybody other than the two courts of appeals right. that are above them. So I, I think in that regard, what I see is judges who are not afraid to make decisions uh, and worried about the consequences that could come from those Here's decisions. Here's something I've always wanted, you may have an answer to this, where do federal judges go out to eat? I have never seen a federal <laughs> judge, I have never seen a federal judge outside of the courthouse. I don't know where they go. I, I, it's because they see you, Chris, and they, they run. They have their own run. They have their own restaurants. <laughs> I don't know. No, no, Chris, no, leave us alone. <laughs> He's always here. No, Chris. He's always around. Uh, and so, Chris, I had, I had another question for you. Uh, so when, we, when we're talking about the current election, do you think any system, be it, or well, let's, let's say the critical plan uh, versus the current plan right now, do you think it would be fair if, let's say, Houston wasn't all, all, all red or all blue? We were actually just purple, a mix, so that in every election, man, you might get more Democrats today, but tomorrow you get more Republicans. So everybody has a constant fear or of, of losing to whatever swing the, uh, the, the, the parties go. Do you think that in and of itself, no matter whether you have a straight ticket or not, uh, party designation or not, would still would lead to a, a more fair result if, if, the, if the city itself wasn't red or blue, it was just purple? Well, uh, no, because you're, you're, you're still going to be, if, if you're in a partisan system, then you're still going to be drawing up sides. And so there's the only way, in my view, to make the judiciary fair completely fair is to take the politics out of it mm -hmm. and and the only way we can take the politics out of it is to let them run in a nonpartisan way and look there's still going to be Republicans and Democrats running because they're, they're we're, we're still split up in the country but if you can't run as a Republican you can't run as a Democrat and the party can't come in and, 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 and help you then you're gonna see I think a a better judiciary because they don't have to rule the way their party would expect them to rule and they don't have to run for office the way the party would expect them to run. We, got, we have a couple questions coming in on Twitter. Um, Mark Bennett sends us one that is probably not a serious question, but it asks, <laughs> how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Maybe he wanted to see if I could say that 10 times fast on TV. Thank you, I don't know. Mark. But thank you for challenging my abilities on, on the air, Mark. Um, but we do have a question. You talked a little earlier uh, about the DA's race and the two policies, and I think you were talking about the the marijuana and the non-prosecution or right. the, of, of Kim Og and I guess the, the program, the second chance program, I think is what it calls it, first chance program. Right. I'm not sure the actual name of it, but the, um, the Twitter question is, how much marijuana triggers exclusion from this program, if you know? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I haven't seen either of their programs to that level of detail. Um, I would imagine, though, that they're both talking about uh, the misdemeanor amounts of marijuana, which would be under four ounces. And so um, anything under four ounces, and, and I'm just guessing right now, but anything under four ounces, you're going to be eligible for these programs. Anything over that, then you're not. That, that's, that's my guess. And I, I would assume, I mean, they, they, have they had a lot of, have we got a lot of literature on it yet? or any No, I haven't seen anything. I mean, they, they're giving speeches on it all the time. But um, I think that that they've moved away from that because you know really when you're gonna when you've got to run for office when to get elected as a tough on crime DA you don't also want to be going out at the same time I'm gonna be tough on crime but not prosecute this yeah I mean, you can go home <laughs> be safe. so I mean I think that that came and it went and I don't think you're gonna see a whole lot about it for now in the election day do, do you think we'll get in the future and because I know one of the things one of the biggest issues we've got another election coming up in 2016 Chris right I mean this is this is just a midterm uh, election and it's due to uh, Devin Anderson's appointment uh, to take over. So are we going to have this whole thing over again? I mean, is, if, if Kim Og loses this time, is she going to challenge again in 2016 or well, is it going to be open for somebody I else? think it depends on, on how close the race is. If, 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 if Devin wins and Kim Og is, you know, within three points, then you, you, you might see her come back in 2016. If she gets blown out by 10 points, I don't, you know, I, don't, I doubt it. I mean, but that's that's Kim's decision. But you know, the the further, the wider the gap, the harder it's going to be. But in 2016, you have a presidential race, mm -hmm. and if and, and this is all speculation, but let's assume Hillary Clinton runs and wins the nomination. I think Hillary Clinton clearly carries Harris County, which makes it a lot more attractive for Democrats to put on a good, effective, hard campaign in 2016. If you got Hillary at the top, okay. Chris, 
That's all the time we got tonight, man. Oh, is it over? You? It's over already. I, I hate to break it to you. <laughs> I'm but, glad to uh, be here. You've got another show coming up Sunday, so I'm That's right. be able to go to work. Six to eight a.m. <laughs> Six to eight a.m. Sunday morning. The, the <laughs> best time to watch TV. That's right. I have to get up at four. Y'all can at least get up at six. I go to bed at five. So it's like <laughs> I have a four-year-old. I'm not. I'm not getting up anytime in the in the mid morning. It'll be early. Uh, we want to thank our guest Chris Tritico for joining us this evening. You can watch him on Sunday mornings on Fox 26. His show is The Roundup. Uh, he always gives a good show and always has a good group of guests and panelists, and he's always talking politics. So if you want to follow him some more, you can follow him at Tritico Rainey on Twitter. And again, you can follow us on Facebook, HCCLA Reasonable Doubt, and on Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. That's all our time for this week, folks. We'll see you next week. Thanks a bunch for joining us. Don't forget to get out there and vote, guys. You got to vote. Absolutely. By the way, so.